a musician playing an acoustic instrument in an acoustic setting, one of the important skills to learn is to play in a large hall, uh, especially when you're getting ready for an audition or if you're playing a concerto or any other concert in a, in a large space. There's things you have to adjust about your playing, exactly how you make the articulations, the sound. And a lot of us practice this by either having friends go out in the hall to listen to us, maybe swapping, having the other person play so you get a feel for it, what it is. Or sometimes you would put a recorder in the back of the hall, record yourself while you're playing, then you go back and listen and you sort of translate, you hear what worked, what didn't, you come back to your instrument, play it again, try to adjust what you can and sort of go back and forth. Um, so that's a very standard process that a lot of us use. Uh, but my friend and colleague here, Aaron Blick, has been experimenting with a way to do this in time so you don't have to go back and forth. So. Tell us about this. How did you come up with it and what was your sort of journey of working this out? Sure. Um, yeah. So, you know, like a lot of other students, I was trying to figure out my own sound, kind of come into my own as I started, uh, you know, working my way up and, and starting to get ready for some auditions. And um, one of the things I was noticing was that my experience while playing, especially in front of other people, was that um, I wasn't getting a good impression of how my sound was coming across to someone who was listening to me from like, a third person perspective, you know, 20 feet away. Uh, how large rooms were you playing in when you were, when you were prepping? Um, usually about the size of a rehearsal room or, you know, a larger mm -hmm. recital space or something mm -hmm. like that. Somewhere, it, it originally came to me kind of in like a studio class setting. Okay. So a room of kind of that size. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I would notice that after I finished playing, I'd always have questions like, well, was this soft enough? Was this clear enough? Was yep. this, you know, scratch of the string coming across to you over there? And a lot of times, you know, thankfully I would get the answer no, but for me that would drive me crazy <laughs> because in all I could hear while I was playing was these things that I was hyper-focusing on that weren't actually even issues at all. Um, so one of the things that um, I ended up experiment experimenting with was an idea I got from my teacher David Almore at USC was, um, you know, coming up with a setup that would allow me to monitor my own playing. So mm -hmm. when I say monitor my own playing, it's like in a studio setting where if you go into a recording environment, they'll give you some headphones and you'll sit down in front of a microphone and you can kind of hear how your sound is going through their system. So what was the first initial setup mm -hmm. you tried? So the very first setup I tried was um, basically some Bluetooth headphones connected mm -hmm. to an iPhone. Okay. Um, and this had some issues because one, it was wireless, so there was a delay, but I, you know, it started out with the idea of being, well, how do I hear what's what's that far away um, as easily as possible? So obviously wireless connection makes the most sense. Um, and I noticed that I, I had some good results, but I could only really play one note at a time because there was about a full note delay in everything so, I did. So, like, exactly, so it, was, it started out kind of nice because I could just be like, okay, I could work on this long note, I could work on the sound, how it's coming across, I could work on individual notes, um, but I couldn't really, start doing anything more than that right away. So, uh, you know, I kept playing with it, mm -hmm. <laughs> came up with some different ideas, and eventually um, I realized I could order a long 25-foot headphone cable online and mm -hmm. plug it into my phone. And so that's what I started doing. I started taking that everywhere with me. And Wait, so just into your phone? Yeah, originally just into my phone. This was okay. back when phones still had headphone jacks. <laughs> and um, and uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, I would just use that, and I started thinking, well, I. I record my lessons over a Zoom camera, and the Zoom camera has a little headphone jack in it, so maybe I should try that. So mm -hmm. I started working with that, and it worked great. It has an automatic monitoring function, which is awesome. All you have to do is plug your headphones into it. Which headphones did you start using when you first did it? Um, I had a pair of uh, wireless Bose like noise-canceling headphones. Okay. I can't remember. But you had noise-canceling from the beginning that was yes, part of it? that was part of it as okay. well. And one of the things that was helpful about that was that not only was I able to hear my sound from further away, but it was kind of blocking out all this mm -hmm. junk. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so what did you notice yeah. when you first started doing it then? What, what were the biggest initial takeaways? The biggest initial takeaways were that uh, I didn't need to work so hard to play loud. And I That's needed to work maybe a little bit less hard to play soft. Okay. And I also, uh, my phrasing was not quite as expressive as I thought it was from this perspective. So you had to... Basically, be more expansive in that way. Exactly, it felt more like I had to kind of uh, exaggerate a lot of the things that I was doing in a way that would maybe not be perceived by someone who was standing right next to me. That's interesting about the volume, though, because a lot of times mm -hmm. when you get in a big room, you feel like, okay, I've got to really, it's like, oh, right. I, 
right? <laughs> Dig right. in. So it was mm -hmm. so it was a different quality of tone that carried. Um, it was or... it was a little bit uh, clearer, and I noticed that you know again I kind of noticed a little bit of more press sound because I was trying so hard to fill the space before, exactly. and I could ease up a little bit, and then my sound really opened up. And it's funny how taking maybe ten percent off of my uh, energy that I was putting into the bass actually gave me you know. 10% more sound because the bass just could ring more. Got it. Resonance. Um, but it was, an, it was an interesting, you know, disconnect of being like, well, I have to work so hard to fill this entire giant space that I'm yeah. in. And being like, no, uh, actually, I need to work less hard and that will take me a little further. Um, right. So it seems like mm -hmm. just having that instant feedback allowed you to just change things right away. Yeah. And that was, that was the other um, noticeable thing about this was that um, I've gone through a lot of times of working through things and having to record myself and, and upload it to a computer and take the time to go back and forth and it, it can get kind of frustra mm -hmm. frustrating after a, a couple hours of doing that. Right. Um, and so one of the things that this setup also allowed me to do was I could hear the things that I would normally maybe write down in a notebook or something like that after I go back and listen to it but be able to adjust right away mm -hmm. and not have to leave a gap of time to you know plug into my computer, watch the video, warm back up. Try it again. Right. Um, so yeah. I guess my next question would be, mm -hmm. what was the process like though then once you took the headphones off? Was right. it, what, what was it? <laughs> <laughs> so initially, you know, it's easy to fall right back into the old habits because mm -hmm. you don't have that stimulus of hearing what it sounds like from further away. So um, taking this into a uh, practice room, I started to think about the things that I was doing physically to create the sound that I wanted from further away. Got it. So okay. things like, how I'm setting the bow on the string, how uh, how much bow I'm using, how close I am to the bridge, or how mm -hmm. close I am to the fingerboard, things like that, and really trying to dial in those physical things once I established what I wanted to hear. Right. Did you still mm -hmm. use the headphones in the practice room ever? Like yes. Canceling ones. Yeah. So that was a key part of the process. That was, um, and you know, one of the things I started realizing was that the more I could do this setup, even if it was in a smaller practice room space, it may not be as perfect as being in a large space, but you know, it's harder to get large spaces to practice in all the time. So, right. so the you more... can still run the cable and have it at like mm -hmm. a far corner of the... As far as I could, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, Did you ever use the noise canceling without a feed? Uh, yes. I've also experimented with that. And that was actually kind of the tail end of like, if I was preparing for an audition, which would be going in the complete opposite direction and taking away all aural stimulus mm -hmm. and trying to shut out any noise and just focus on the physical things. Mm -hmm. And trust that if I'm doing the same physical movements and the same physical feeling and I'm getting the same response from my left hand and my right hand mm -hmm. while I'm playing, I can trust that my sound is going to come across the way it did when I was performing for the, the camera across right. the room. So, um, and then that ended up, you know, being true as I, the more I did it, the more I, you know, would record myself in that situation, the more I realized, oh yeah, this, this sounds exactly like I should expect it to sound Yeah. while I'm playing on stage or while I'm, you know, performing in a concert or a recital or even in an audition, any any kinds of situations like that. Cool. Um, so before we go do our test, can you just tell us what yeah. exact equipment did you end up with for your, yeah. your small portable setup? Of course. Yeah, so it's really simple. Um, I use a Zoom uh, Q2N camera now, um, but really any kind of Zoom equipment will work, you know, either an H4 with just a microphone. Anything that has a monitor out. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and it doesn't have to be a Zoom camera either. There are ways to do it with a phone. But I, for me, the most portable, easy setup for me is using a Zoom Q2N. Okay. And then I have an extra long, double-sided, 25-foot uh, headphone cable, which okay. you can find at you know, Best Buy or online or wherever you want to order it from. And then um, right now I'm using a pair of Sony noise-canceling headphones. Okay. Um, yeah. So Sweet. Pretty right, much let's, it. Easy let's to take the back. Yeah. Okay. Let's do it. Sweet. So for the first experiment, we're going to do, well, we have two cameras. One's right by me, and you'll hear the sound from that, and then we'll jump to the sound from far away. Uh, first, I just want to hear my bass as I experience it here, and then I'm going to try the headphones.
All right, that gives me something to start with. So now, headphones on. All right, I already hear a lot more room, which is what you get. So what first was a G scale thing. Oh. Conversation I had with Kurt Maroki a long time ago when he talked about playing the hall. Whereas it's we're not just playing the bass, we're playing the halls. Because right now I'm hearing the sound reflecting off all the surfaces and it changes the colors and it changes what comes through. So the articulations are coming through more than I thought they might. So first I'm gonna try a like a sharp spiccato. Now I'm gonna make it longer. Now that's what actually surprises him way more. It's like the envelope around that note. I actually feel like I need to make it longer when I hear it from a distance. Want to see how that compares? Since it's instantaneous, I can just try five different versions right now. And just, 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 oh, that's the one. I yep. to one, go off there, come back. <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I think this is what you were saying about playing loud. Yeah. And I'm finding that it's more of drawing the sound out. And I really don't have to no. kick it as much as I thought. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess the analogy I was thinking of was uh, with actors. 
when you're doing stage stage acting, you need to, need to enunciate everything so clearly for it to come out. But I, it seems like for certain frequencies, at least you don't have to. No, yeah, and as much. It, it's really more about the body, mm -hmm. I find, and less about how much articulation you're using, unless yeah. you really need it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and, and you notice like the sound blooms as you let more of that focus go into the body of the note and less of thinking about having to get the string to start. And th these were some of the same things that I was noticing when mm -hmm. I first started doing it. The other interesting thing for me, I, this, I mean, this is a rehearsal room. It's a little on the bright side. Mm -hmm. what, the, the hall that I've spent most of my time doing this is Compton Symphony Hall, which right. is the San Diego Symphony's um, hall, which is getting renovated right now. So it'll be interesting <laughs> to see how it's different. But that hall tended to be very muddy in the, in the base area. So we actually did have to do a lot more very, very strong fronts. Right. Even though that might not have carried, it got the notes to speak right away. Right. Because in that hall, it tended to be very. Uh, yeah. So, but, the, but this is where in every room you can just have a little. You get more knowledge. Yeah, and it also so, it also teaches you how to play to different rooms as well. Because the more you can experiment with, uh, you know, let's say a room that's more resonant, or a room that's more dry, or a room that's extremely wet and very hard to have clarity and things like that. The more you learn how to play to those spaces, so when you go yeah. into a situation where you're like, "Oh, the first thing I played feels maybe a little bit different than I thought," I know exactly how to adjust to that. Yeah. And so, the same way you would, you know, play in a bunch of different spaces as you're preparing for a performance or audition. Mm -hmm. so. Do you want to take a turn? I know sure. this is not your base, so there'll, there'll <laughs> be something for you to adjust to. Absolutely. So you can grab your bow if you want, or you can use this one. on. Maybe a little bit too much articulation, and you notice I got stuck yeah. right here from overworking it a little bit. Um, and I felt like I could kind of hear the shaping of my scale a little bit better. Um, one of the things that I've kind of trained myself to listen for when I put the headphones on is immediately go right to sound quality and direction of the brakes. Um, just because to me, those are two of the things that get lost the most when I'm kind of playing for people. Okay. And the thing, two things that I tend to not think about as much as I'm playing for people. Just because I'll be so focused on something technical, something being clear, something being in tune, that it's it's easy to get distracted by those things that I yeah. have here. So um, in a sense, this is teaching you where to put your attention. Exactly. Yeah. That's interesting. The other thing I do notice, even because I, I was complaining yeah. that it sounded a little bright out here, mm -hmm. what I noticed just going back and forth is, at least on this bass, it's much darker. Mm -hmm. Here, as soon as I get back out here, suddenly 
it's it is brighter and the articulations are popping more than I thought. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. And I've had the space for a long time, but just <laughs> that, this is part of where the feedback loop goes is it's not just learning something one time. It's like playing scales. We have to constantly remind ourselves and adjust and, and tweak. Yeah. Do you want to do something like off the string? Sure. What are the biggest challenges, off the string or soft? You, I think you said both. I think both. I think making sure that I'm not working too hard to be articulate with off the string or short strokes, and then maybe not worrying so much about the core of my sound being an issue as I'm playing soft. So something like the scherzo. With the headphones off, to me, that might sound like I'm almost not even activating the string. Like to me, what I'm used to is something that's, you know, I'm used to having core in the sound, a rounded note, even in the soft dynamic from here, because you want to know that that note is clear and rounded and speaking. But as soon as I put the headphones on, I notice that that's not really what I'm, I need anymore. Okay. I want a more diffuse. But no. even right there, I, you did that small adjustment. It's like a little bit too much, and then you pulled it just enough in focus. Right. Which is very interesting to me. That kind of thing. Yeah. Um, it's amazing to me how this allows you just to do all that fine tweaking immediately. Yeah. Because we, we always do that kind of tweaking tweaking when we're practicing. It's just like, you no, know, a little bit more of this, a little bit of this. Yeah. And now it's just like, right now, I can do all this stuff. Exactly. It's like having the, you know, the knobs in the studio ready ready to go at, at your whim. You know, oh, okay, I need a little bit more, um, you know, soda voce for this. Yeah. So, oh, let's take a little bit of hair off, you know. And the, the thing is, is that as we practice and as we work on our technical things, specifically, we build the vocabulary to be able to do these things more quickly. We know, okay, I'm getting this sound, but I want more of this. I know what I need to change in my parameters of what I'm doing with the bow and what I'm doing with my left hand to make those adjustments. Yeah. And it's also saving us time by not having to go back and forth. And um, and you're also more likely to do it. More likely to do it, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so now, just since, since you did the headphones, with the headphones off, can you show me, what, what did that feel like, what you just played, like what you found there? Let me try it one more time. Just okay. <laughs> Get some recency. That seems like a pretty spot on match. So you did that mainly by feel? Or yeah. What, tell me again, what exactly were yeah. you focusing once you took your headphones off? Once I took the headphones off, I was really trying to focus on my contact point, my bow speed, how much of the bow I needed. And a lot of times it feels like I don't have to use quite as much as I think. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the shape I'm making with my arm, making sure that this is a repeatable motion as I go through the string crossing. Yeah. Um, and also just, you know, Taking note of how I'm holding the bow, you know, I'm rolling back on the hair a lot mm -hmm. um, and trying to match that every single time. So at a certain point, once you have established what you want and you know that you can execute it, then it's just about the repetition. Then you're yeah. building the good habits of, okay, every time I play this excerpt, mm -hmm. I'm going to do this exact same right. start. This is the feel. This is where exactly. I go. Since we have Mozart 35 coming up, <laughs> what, um, which part of that stroke... Uh, would be most important to tweak in this situation? I would say the length. The length. I was um, thinking that too. Um, like. The, 
the louder the note is, the longer it's going to ring. Mm -hmm. And you want the size of each of those notes to be proportional. So if you shorten it up, it leaves a similar size gap in between each one to four. Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Then the interesting thing is to see what length actually carries the tone. Because if you right. make it too short, it might sound yeah. nice and articulate there, but all you're going to get is. So, all right, let's dial it in. strokes we all learn and then have to relearn and then continue yes so the way I, I originally the way that Hal Robinson taught it was when you start out slow you do everything on the string and then you start going more off so I but, anyway. but that gets you to pretty close I'm not quite sure where I want to get the feedback, but that's close. It's a little more off. It's probably too far off. Let's find out. Oh, okay. Yeah, my instinct is I do need to get more into the string to get the tone there. Sound weird. Whoa! <laughs> Go for the feel, right? Yep. So I started on, and then I had that much, I think. Again, it's so cool how you can tweak um, just the length so quickly. <laughs> it's gonna sound weird. Whoa! <laughs> Go for the feel, right? Yep. So I started on, and then I had that much, I think. And then uh, support it up here. Almost a little more on the string there. No, too off. There we go. Hmm. I want to check. Actually, those are the other notes I want to check. Mm -hmm. It's the... It's hard to know. This is something that I feel like everyone gets a different answer is how much articulation you use on the octaves, right? So the thing is I want immediate, but I don't I don't need a like a but I do want immediate tone. Because I don't want right. Like, which often that's how it sounds in the hall, but Okay, there it is. Immediate, but it's not a huge articulation. Too 
short, but here the, the rate is still going. I don't get the difference. And, yeah. and it's easier actually. So different. Wow. So this is something I, I would, you know, take a half an hour and like to just find it, take them yeah. off, find it, take them off. But again, it's immediate. I could just go back and forth, and I don't have to run across the room. Now, granted, when we, you know, perform this, and we have, you know, ninety other colleagues on stage, it's important to take, you know, that we don't turn our ears off. And right. so. This is maybe more of a focused idea for playing by yourself or for practicing it or getting something to a, you know, a default way you want to sound it. And then as we, you know, go into rehearsal and play with our colleagues, it's important to not just go by feel, but also still be able to adjust based on what you're hearing everyone else do too. So. Right. But it's both. It still informs you right. physically about what probably will work best. Exactly. Yeah. And it already gets you much further ahead, but you're right. You still need to. Yeah. <laughs> you still need to, listen to, it's still just to go only on feel and rehearsal and then. You look up and you're not with anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, any other big takeaways that you've had from this process? Um, one other thing, if there's time, I yeah. wouldn't mind trying something a little bit more soloistic just to maybe focus on how phrasing feels different with the headphones on, how exaggerating more actually comes across over here as opposed to what feels like we're doing a lot in our you know, small little bubble around right. us. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if there's time, I wouldn't mind sure. trying that as well. You want to do it yourself or you want me to do it? Sure, I'm happy to do it. <laughs> cool. Uh, so for this one, Aaron's going to try, he's back to his bass. It's a little more familiar, um, but he hasn't had any chance to warm up on this piece. We're just trying it for um, expression. The ringer. Yeah, exactly. Cool. All right, so this is um, basically just the opening of Bottasini, second concerto, with no monitoring settings. For cold, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's it's gotten a lot of work over the years. <laughs> now again, you have, Aaron hasn't played in this room for. Have you played in here before? Maybe. Oh, Six it's Space Fest. Okay. Yeah. But it's been a while, so again, everything's sort of still adjusting. Felt like I had to work pretty hard. Okay. At the moment, so we'll see how see this, what this is like. This feels now. With it. I was getting, mm -hmm. especially for you know the beginning of a phrase or the end of a phrase. I feel like 
I didn't have to be as worried about the clarity coming across, okay. um, even at a softer dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, I felt more aware of how connected my phrases were. I noticed that there were a couple of moments that had maybe a little bit more of a gap, and I'm curious to check this on the tape later, but yeah. there was maybe not quite as much connection the first time, and the second time I realized that I had to fill out space on a longer note. Gotcha. A little gotcha. bit longer. So, you know, the tendency would be to, you know, kind of hang on a long note and get ready for the next step to start moving, but you start to realize that sometimes the, the long note is actually where it's more important to do something with because you don't have the, the notes telling you where to go. So yeah. you have a little bit more of a chance to have some personal expression. So we're going to try it now without the headphones again. Yeah, let's see if I can. I'm just going to go back and forth. Sure. Because it's, it's, that's part of the process too. Mm -hmm. It starts the brightness. Like, right. That's where it comes from. Which can be really frustrating when you're sitting here ninety nine percent of the time. Right. Um, yeah. So that's what it's <laughs> about. So one question: If yeah. you were doing this and somebody said, "Actually, we need you to project louder," like mm -hmm. if you were in a significantly bigger room, mm -hmm. can you try to get them with headphones and just sure. see how far could you, how expansive could you get while still making it sound good on here? Sure. And what do you have to adjust to do that? So what did you do? Or what did you change? I used a lot more bow. Yeah. <laughs> but I didn't quite maybe adjust closer to the bridge as I would instinctually do if I was just playing without the headphones. Okay. One of the things that I tend to notice is as I rely on this to get louder, uh, you mean the bridge, Going closer to the bridge, to the bridge uh -huh. as opposed to starting with more bow, is I start to hear more of the string noise. I start to hear more, maybe a little few more of the things that I would hear from back here, out there. Hmm. And not that playing Nick closer to the bridge is not a good thing, and we, we need to do it a lot, and it's always kind of a tendency to kind of shy away from the bridge. Yeah. But in terms of projection, and especially for something expressive like this in a high register, I find that it felt better to use more bow on some of these phrases to expand my sound than to focus on it being laser focused. Just for comparison, can you do the laser focus and so we can sure. see how it happens? sounds <laughs> there and here, and then go back to what you just did? Sure, I'll do my best. <laughs> To, you don't even have to play the whole thing, but back to the previous one you did with just more bow. Nice, nice. It, it is very different. So what I noticed when you play close to the bridge, it does get you more focus sound. Yes. More this, but the sound's much broader, more beautiful, and varied mm -hmm. when you did just the more bow and didn't get quite so close to the, the bridge. Yeah. And I mean, I guess I should say, on that bass, with those strings, of in this room, yes. there's always those... And also with my own kind of personal biases about how I like to hear myself play this as well. Yeah, yeah. but the instrument clearly responded differently between mm -hmm. those two. 
Cool. All right. So this is just all fascinating stuff for me. <laughs> it's continually fascinating, and that's why it's fun to just have a process like this, so you can yeah. start experimenting yourself and and do that. Mm -hmm. um, just with this whole setup, is there are there any pitfalls, just equipment wise, or I don't know anything else you run into that people should be aware of? What things that might not work? You I talked about the latency. So if you're doing this with Bluetooth. Bluetooth always has I would a stay away. Delay. I would so. stay away from trying to, trying with Bluetooth unless you have no other option. In which case, you're going to find that the delay becomes an mm -hmm. issue. Um, you also mentioned, sorry, I'm interrupting, yeah, but go ahead. you mentioned that now you're actually not with these headphones. They're over the ears, but you have the noise canceling turned off for now because you said it, yes. sometimes it colors the sound a little bit. A little bit, and it's helpful to have the noise canceling. I think an overall kind of umbrella caveat of this whole thing is that it's never going to be the most true sound that you would get if you were using your own ears to listen. Yeah. And there's always going to be some slight variable with any gear that you use. Right. But the right. idea is that this maybe will get you 90% of an impression or 95% of an impression of how you're coming across. And mm -hmm. a lot of times when we have to send tapes for like a festival audition or for an audition for something else, this is what we have to use. So this is what they're going to be experiencing. So there is a lot of value in the sound, but just know that there is no perfect solution where you're going to be able to mimic the human ear sound over there. Yeah. So, um, but really, it's just whatever you can get your hands on that will do the setup for you. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. <laughs> well, thanks for showing the setup. And of course. My pleasure. Thanks for I did experiment with this some more <laughs> as well in a lot of different rooms. So thanks. Of course.